wonderful. Well, good afternoon, everybody. And uh, the last uh, talk of the day falls to me. Wonderful films there. Wonderful. Um, I'm going to take you out uh, this afternoon to Wales and Ireland to tell you a little bit, little bit about uh, the Cherish project, which began on the 1st of January this year. Uh, I draw attention to our wonderful trilingual logo there, Irish, Welsh and English. Cherish, climate, heritage and environments of reefs, islands and headlands. I'll tell you a little bit about what the project is, some of the survey approaches we'll be employing to look at the coastlines of Ireland and Wales, and then we'll finish by looking at some of the new work we've been doing uh, in the last couple of months. Uh, Cherish uh, is a five-year European-funded project. We're lucky enough in Wales to have an interreg project, uh, which looks at the convergence areas of Wales and Ireland together. Um, so you can see our convergence areas down here on the bottom map there. It's distinct areas of West Wales and East and Southern Ireland that the funding is directed towards. Um, and we have uh, the joining forces of the title, the four quite diverse partners who are working together on this new five-year project. Uh, and it's really enlivening, it's energising to be working with such different partners, not just with the archaeologists really. Ourselves, I should introduce myself, Toby Driver, the Royal Commission on Ancient Monuments in Aberystwyth. I'm the senior aerial investigator there. We're the national body for the survey of, and record of the historic environment in Wales. We're working with Aberystwyth University's geography department, where we have climate experts, historic weather experts, luminescence dating specialists, so we can call on all of those for the project, which is very exciting. The Geological Survey of Ireland is joining us, so they have a fleet of survey vessels, they're experts in marine mapping and surveying the inshore waters of Ireland. And finally, the Discovery Programme, who are sort of expert geo-surveyors. Uh, they really know how to work with their technology, their 3D modelling, their laser scanning. They've been doing some wonderful work. So we've got a good partnership there. As with any big project, a bit like Citizen, we had two years of business planning. We've developed our nine initiatives, which will deliver our eight ultimate changes. We have equality and diversity targets. Uh, Welsh language targets, all that sort of thing in there. But the project is in essentially boils down to these four pillars. Some of you may have read them already, uh, but the, getting this team together of diverse specialists, getting that new baseline data right for the coast. We have some real data issues in the coastlines of Wales and Ireland. Tackling the, the gap between low tide and high tide and reconstructing our past weather histories as well. Another aspect of the joining forces of the title is bringing Wales and Ireland together. And these are our uh, joint survey areas uh, in sort of north of Dublin Bay, Wicklow, uh, Wexford, the Waterford eroding coastline and areas of Dingle and the Skelligs out here, and then parts of the Welsh coastline here as well. Focusing on islands uh, of the title, really, those difficult and more remote places to get to that people have often avoided in the past, those really badly eroding sections of coastline like Waterford and South Ceredigion, but also our knowledge and data gaps. What do we know le least about? And the critical thing here is our first initiative, getting our joint nation teams to work together. And that means over the course of the project, uh, if Dan, Dan's with me at the back there, if Dan's working down with the, the discovery program at the Skelligs one day, or Sarah Davis from Aberystwyth University is working in North Anglesey, we're all part of one survey team working towards one aim with a set uh, series of working methods. That's what we're aiming to achieve. We would have quite a lot of climate change science this afternoon. We missed Hannah's talk, but I won't infill about you know, all the sort of predicted sea level change, sea level rise, the droughts, uh, the, the increased rainfall. But we have some severe climate uh, change issues coming. We have islands like Grasholm in uh, off West Wales, where we have prehistoric structures under a very fragile coastal soil which is being decimated by uh, rainfall, uh, drought, and then nesting gannets moving over it as well. So we have some real issues. This archaeology is disappearing. The policy context, the Welsh European Funding Office is funding us. It's European money. And we have one thing to deliver over five years to increase knowledge and capacity amongst coastal communities. And how we do that is up to us. And we're having that evaluated as well. But we see here the most recent climate change report for Wales, the CCRA for 2017, still talks about significant evidence gaps, and that's a real concern. Looking around the coast of Wales, doing uh, work on promontory forts and uh, experimenting with the LIDAR over the last decade, we've certainly seen some of those data gaps. Uh, here's the Clare portal for Wales, where we have all the uh, freely available LIDAR uploaded. So this is a current map, 
uh, of West Wales on uh, airborne laser scanning availability. Now, we know that we need better than half metre resolution for airborne laser scanning to do anything meaningful uh, for, from an archaeological point of view. And that's a map of data better than one metre. It's huge gaps of the coast, many parts not covered at all. This is Skomer Island, a wonderful island here. We paid for that half metre data in 2011, and that's why it's been covered. We found in the past that if you'd overlay detailed surveys of promontory forts on two metre data, the mapping of the cliff edge just isn't accurate enough. And what we want to know from this project is, where is that cliff edge now? How is it being affected by erosion? Where was it 50 years ago? And where will it be in 50 years' time? It's getting those baselines set. Many of us have worked with RAF photographs as well. This is 1946 and 2006 on a promontory fort. But the sort of information, the sort of air photographs you get on Google Earth, flown in flat summer light, are just, you can't compare those to the winter photographs that the RAF are often taking. How do you get that similar data set? But we've got a lot of work now to bring together what we're doing in Wales and Ireland and get an agreed approach to assessing the coastal zone. Perhaps the best way to uh, explain how we're hitting the coast with everything we have is this sort of quick graphic here. Um, now, being an aerial archaeologist, I'm happy in this zone up here, using LIDAR, using uh, oblique aerial reconnaissance, uh, and a bit of ground survey to understand what we're looking at. But we're working with Aberystwyth University as well, they're looking at back barrier lagoons and peat beds near to the coast where they can get comparable data sets on past storm events, wave overtopping, uh, dating back the last couple of millennia at least, and also looking at luminescence dating, so dating sediment where we have no charcoal and no fines. When was it last exposed to the sun? Working with a discovery programme, we can begin to develop our technologies with drone survey. We've seen many good examples of that today. And high-end laser scanning to map change in the coastal zone. And then the Geological Survey of Ireland will be getting their big ships offshore and we're deploying divers under the water to look at some indicator wrecks as well. So we're using various techniques, this toolkit approach, to uh, look at the coastal zone. Now we've got that great word innovative up there. There's nothing much innovative about geophysical survey here and magnetometry. But then here we are on Scombe Island last September doing geophysical survey in a highly protected national nature reserve where you can't step off the path because of ground nesting birds. We did the first geophysical survey on Skomer Island, uh, looking at the prehistoric landscapes, in 2012, the first ever survey. And often pushing this technology out to the more remote, difficult sea stacks, the headlands, the islands, is where uh, the difficulty comes. That's what we hope to do with Cherish. We have the cash, we have the techniques to get out there. We've got money for small-scale excavations and interventions to recover datable material and artefacts. And working with the Discovery Programme, they've been doing a lot of high-end laser scanning, refining this technique to, to look at small changes in dry stone structures. And here we have Skellig Michael, which will be more famous in a couple of months for its role in the Star Wars film. Uh, obviously have an increase in pressure and visitors here. Uh, but with su successive revisits each year for the Office of Public Works, the Discovery Programme have been refining laser scanning of the same sections of dry stone walling to look at minute changes, sub-centimetre changes in dry stone walling. Is there slippage? Is there slumping? And all the red there shows tourists moving stones around on the top of the wall at the Skellig Monastery there, you see, showing change over a particular period. And we're also training up uh, to, to use drones sort of legally and safely, uh, though it is a long process, as has been alluded to uh, today. It's exciting, too, working with the Ge Geological Survey of Ireland. They've been completing a lot of inshore mapping around Ireland for their Infomar project over the years, uh, completing these real maps of islands where you can have seamless onshore and offshore mapping. So drone survey down at extreme low tide and extreme high tide bringing inshore survey vessels in for bathymetric survey and thus linking the two, eliminating that white ribbon where we, we can't quite get the data. Uh, we'll be focusing in multi-beam surveys on a selection of wrecks that are so difficult to see otherwise, especially in deeper water, and choosing an some indicator wrecks, both wooden and metal wrecks, to see how they're suffering in stormy waters how they're suffering with increased acidity as well. Uh, but it's a complicated process doing anything under the sea, as many of you will appreciate. We'll get our maritime subgroup established, and we're working through the ways to get those Irish vessels into Welsh waters and complement our study sites uh, on the mainland. But it's been particularly exciting working with the geographers in Aberystwyth University. Um, as an archaeologist, most of the time we do our work on site, bag up the wet soil and send it to somebody. And about three months later, it all comes back. 
And that's not, not what we're doing in Cherish. We're actually going out with the geographers now for the coring, for the luminescence dating. This is Jeff Duller, who did the English Heritage Guidelines for luminescence dating out on SCOMA earlier this year, discussing our project areas, uh, learning from them about what we need to look for in terms of potential, and they're going out and doing work complementary uh, to the sort of landscapes we're doing as well. And then we have Sarah Davis here, who's also really into historical storm research, uh, reminding us that the big storms we see nowadays that really hit the news have happened back in 1910, have happened back in the medieval times as well. Uh, and also doing a lot of work with coastal communities. And we don't need to say that the people living on the coast are often have a deep appreciation of climate change and, and long-term change. And they can tell us an enormous amount about that, uh, rather than us taking a message uh, to them. So we've had a six-month set-up in intensive stakeholder contact since the 1st of January. It's been a very, very busy year. Uh, but we're beginning to generate data and results now, which is wonderful. Uh, we've got everybody in place, all our, our new archaeologists appointed across in Wales and Ireland. Um, and one of the things we did very early on in the project on the Welsh side was to commission new airborne laser scanning for six of the Welsh islands. So six key islands, not a stitch of 3D geomatic data for any of them. Nothing. Nobody's going to fund it. It's not a priority. It's not a coastal town. It's not hard defences. It's, it's a nature reserve. And so we commissioned in February Blue Sky International to fly 25 centimetre low tide data. That was delivered to us. We had to wait till Dan joined us in post a few months ago to have the time to start working on that. Uh, and we have iconic islands like Bardsey Island, unessentially, a place of pilgrimage since the Middle Ages for its abbey on the north part of the island. And you can see it's eroding isthmus here. Here's that eroding isthmus with 25 centimetre uh, high resolution data, a wonderful record. You can see collapsing hard defences around the the isthmus here. You even see individual sheep. These are sheep grazing, these little dots here. So it's got the farmer's sheep and the cows uh, mapped. So it's really, really very good data. And we'll follow this up on the ground now. This fixes it. That is, that is it in February 2017. And we can go in now with uh, higher resolution drone survey and GPS survey for the coast edge as well. Having this absolute height data allows us to roll up flood scenarios as well. It's a two meter flood scenario for the skerries off Anglesey. Um, but the real value comes in taking this to the, the managers, the wardens on the ground. Now, this is Ramsey Island, RSPB Ramsey Island on Pembrokeshire, a wonderful island uh, covered in seals and birds. A real jewel in the crown for the RSPB. But again, before February this year, no high quality 3D data at all. Uh, we flew the uh, data in February and they're so excited they tweeted when they saw the plane coming over the, uh, the island here, hoping they didn't get in the way. And we've gone from February when it's being flown to two weeks ago when we were able to take the LIDAR out to the wardens to show them what we've done. Dan's been mapping the archaeology from the LIDAR using this relief visualisation toolbox to analyse this difficult landscape of heath and rock uh, and get the new data mapped. But it's wonderful to get that out to the land managers. For us, it's a valuable record of the archaeology. For them, they can start to see scrub management issues, heath management issues as well. It's a really good data resource. Another thing we've been doing is establishing baseline monitoring of the coast edge. We've been doing that this year from an aerial uh, photographic perspective in a light aircraft, photographing everything, all the promontory forts and study areas at the start of the project. But the difficult thing was getting this going in Ireland. Ireland's had a haphazard approach to systematic aerial survey over the last 30 years, last systematic stuff done in the early 90s. And so it's really rewarding, finally in late September, when we're able to get flights out of Cork Airport. Uh, and get out to Wexford and Waterford. Uh, and we had a great two days flying in late September to get some of the first baseline aerial monitoring done of the Irish coastline for the Cherish study sites. Uh, taking a photograph out of a window is, is not rocket science in itself. They're the things you have to remember to get a good picture. Uh, but getting up in the air legally and safely is the key thing, finding the right airport, the right operation. Uh, so we took uh, Rob Shaw and uh, Gary Devlin up flying in the back of the plane, which they didn't like because they weren't controlling the flight. So last week they were able to get up on their own from Cork and start their own baseline surveying. Uh, so Cherish is actually getting aerial photography going again in Ireland. We have eroding promontory forts in Waterford here. This is the Tremor coastline here. And the Metal Man on one of the navigational markers who's this 14-foot high cast iron statue of an English Jack Tar pointing out to the scene of a maritime tragedy in the early 19th century. So we've got an English sailor standing on the, the Irish coastline. And this is all, I think, Stephanie's uh, uh, and, uh, and uh, Sinead's back garden, I think, down here. The benefit of this baseline monitoring is becoming immediately clear. 
These are aerial photographs we took of Ladies Island Lake in Wexford with a natural breach there in part of the sand barrier between the lagoon and the sea uh, before Ophelia. And then two weeks ago, Discovery were able to get out with their drone and start taking comparable photographs. And we've seen comparable monitoring by some of the, the groups like the Morecambe Bay group as well. Uh, that we, we need to get as good as that, really. Uh, so, but we can see then as well, this is Gateholm Island and Monastic Island in Pembrokeshire, photographed in April and October after Ophelia, where we've got virtually no change in the tumbled rocks that look loose, but they're not actually moving after a major hurricane. So what has changed, what doesn't change after a major storm? And of course then we'll be doing comparison of 3D imagery as well between the two of those. We also have the benefit of this baseline aerial monitoring in a light aircraft is that we can gather orbital photographs suitable for 3D modelling at the same time um, as part of our work. So with a drone and a Land Rover and a promontory fort, we can do a site in a day. But with a light aircraft in three hours, we can do 40 sites. It's, it's pretty good. This is Dinas Dintley, second to last slide. Dinas Dintley, one of our study sites in North Wales, will be doing some joint nation work out in a couple of weeks. We've lost about a quarter of the site to coastal erosion. An issue for Gwynedd County Council because of the, the coastal village here and the hard defences as well. Uh, but here, for the first time, we can get out the RAF photographs in the 1960s, more recent photographs, but then we can start to produce 3D models, as we've seen a lot of today, from the high-level air photographs, uh, showing the erosion as it is at the moment, and then get more detailed work on the ground with the UAV and the photogrammetry in due course. So it's about getting that precision data. People have been looking for 20 years on how to tackle Dinas Dinsley. It's a complex and dangerous site to, to stand on, and hopefully to cherish with a combination of abseiling, new survey techniques, 3D work, we can actually tackle these difficult sites for the future. And the last joining forces of the title is, uh, is the, the, the real welcome that we've got this year as a new project on the scene, the new kid, as it were. The real welcome we've got from Citizen, particularly from SCAPE, from the major agencies, Historic Environment Scotland, Historic England, CADU, the National Trust, RSPB, uh, all the organisations in Ireland, the National Monument Service and the OPW, etc. We've had nothing but openness and help, uh, assistance. This is how you want to do it. These are our, this is how we work on the GIS and our end. These are our guidelines. Work on these, have these, and so on. It's been a fantastic welcome, and we couldn't have done it without the assistance we've had uh, to get Cherish off the ground. We've got a great advisory panel in place as well, which includes Tom, Jackie Mulva from Cardiff, and other specialists in the coastal and maritime zone as well. So it's been a busy first year, but we're getting results going, which is exciting. Um, our website is currently under reconstruction, will emerge stronger and better. Uh, but our Facebook page is, is busy, so please like us and follow us, as well as our Twitter feed as well. So it's been great to be able to come along and talk about Cherish uh, this afternoon. Thanks for your attention. Uh, and we look forward to having better stuff to show you in coming years. Many thanks. Thank you.